Michael E. Porter introduced the value chain concept in his 1985 book, Competitive Advantage. Since then, Michael Porter has extended his value chain model to encompass mergers and acquisitions, enhancing the traditional framework. The core principles of Porter's value chain are accessible on this channel, with the link available below the video. You can use the model to identify the areas where it would be beneficial for your organization to carry out a merger or acquisition with another organization. These will typically be areas in your value chain where you are weak and where you can find a strong partner. Whether you choose a merger or acquisition is not critical in the context of the model. The value chain's primary activities can be divided into upstream and downstream processes. A company can evaluate the most efficient production methods through upstream processes and determine the necessary raw materials to purchase. It may also consider relocating production to a different country, a practice commonly called outsourcing. Upstream activities consist of three value activities, inbound logistics, operations and parts of outbound logistics. Downstream, the company must consider how it will get its products onto the market. Downstream activities include three value activities, the other part of outbound logistics, marketing and sales, and the last of the three activities, services. Mergers and acquisitions are strategic business decisions that significantly impact a company's value chain. When a company finalizes an acquisition or merger, it can impact the value chain in multiple ways. There are two primary types of integration, vertical integration and horizontal integration. Vertical integration happens when a company merges with or acquires a company at another level in the value chain. For example, when an automobile manufacturer acquires a tyre supplier, it engages in backward vertical integration. This approach can reduce costs, improve coordination and secure the supply chain. A company can decrease the number of its suppliers by acquiring them, thereby streamlining the supply chain. Vertical integration downstream or forward integration occurs when a company eliminates or bypasses its middleman by acquiring them or establishing an online store directly. Horizontal integration occurs when a company merges with or acquires a competitor, leading to increased market share, reduced competition and the creation of economies of scale. When two companies merge or one company acquires the other, a variety of synergies may emerge. Economic synergies result in savings by reducing costs through joint procurement, utilising shared facilities or eliminating redundant functions. Technological synergies arise from sharing technology and innovation, which can result in the creation of new products or enhancement of processes. Geographic expansion through mergers and acquisitions can grant access to new markets and broaden the company's customer base. Mergers and acquisitions can increase a company's bargaining power with suppliers. A larger company might secure more favourable purchasing terms as a result. Two primary effects arise from a merger or acquisition. The first is economies of scale, which imply that as production expands, the cost per unit decreases due to the distribution of fixed costs over more units and the achievement of operational efficiencies. The second effect is the learning or experience curve, which posits that organisational functions become more efficient as production volume increases, thereby lowering unit costs. For instance, if a company's production doubles, the cost per unit is typically expected to fall by a certain percentage, often anticipated to be around 20% when output doubles. Here is how various factors contribute to this effect when a merger or acquisition takes place. 
Workers and machines become more experienced as production volumes increase, reducing production errors. Consequently, product quality is enhanced over time, decreasing the expenses relating to repairs, returns and warranty claims. Companies often obtain better pricing from suppliers by purchasing larger quantities of raw materials or components. Economies of scale occur as the cost per unit decreases with the increase in order size. Improved planning and consolidation of larger loads can reduce transportation costs, as the increased volume can lead to significant savings. Additionally, shipping larger quantities can result in volume discounts from transportation providers. Increasing production allows the company to use its existing facilities and machinery more efficiently. Spreading fixed costs like maintenance and depreciation over more units can reduce the cost per unit. When these factors are combined, the total cost per unit decreases as production increases. The principle suggests that a doubling of output is associated with a 20% reduction in unit cost. Gaining a higher market share through mergers or acquisitions can enhance a company's ability to dictate terms and set customer prices. We shall now review a merger as an example of the value chain. We will examine the value chain through the lens of a merger involving the Danish wind turbine manufacturer Vestas and its potential effects on Vestas's value chain. Let us begin with some facts about Vestas and the merger details. Vestas started as a family-operated blacksmith shop in 1898 and gradually evolved to produce industrial metal goods. Since 1980, Vestas has been manufacturing wind turbines and has grown into one of the world's leading manufacturers since the mid-1990s. In 2004, Vestas merged with Micon, the second largest Danish wind turbine manufacturer. Under the joint name Vestas, the headquarters were moved to Micon's premises in Randers. From 2005 and throughout the following year, Vestas focused internally on completing a genuine merger of the two companies, which, however, continued to operate side by side to an excessive degree. The organisation became more streamlined and market-focused, adapting to the burgeoning markets in Asia and the heightened emphasis on offshore wind turbines. Concurrently, a decision was made to set up production facilities in key regions such as North America and China, with Europe being catered to from Denmark. Vestas restructured into divisions centred on individual business units, establishing a shared value foundation for the now global enterprise. Additionally, IT development progressed rapidly, marked by a comprehensive internal system launch and enhanced customer services, including remote control and diagnostics from the expansive computer network at the headquarters. The onset of the 2010s was marked by a reorganisation that included outsourcing, optimization, and a shift towards Asia's new growth centres. In line with this strategic shift towards globalisation and knowledge, Vestas relocated its headquarters to Aarhus, Denmark, in 2011. How does the value chain look after the merger? which made Vestas a significant player in the industry. We will first examine the five primary activities at the bottom of the model. Then we will explore the four support activities at the model's top. The first primary activity is inbound logistics. Increasing total purchasing volume can improve the negotiating stance with suppliers, potentially reducing costs. The second primary activity is operations. As wind turbine production increases in quantity and scale, additional resources can be devoted to the innovation of novel designs. 
The third primary activity is outbound logistics. The advanced logistics system developed by the company's technology department enhanced the efficiency of distribution and delivery processes. The fourth primary activity is marketing and sales. Detailed customer analyses conducted by the marketing and sales team, with help from the technology department, can enhance targeted marketing and cross-selling. The fifth and primary activity is service. Technological solutions, such as chatbots or automated support systems, can improve the customer service experience. The first of the four support activities is firm infrastructure. Organisational mergers often result in management changes. Difficulties in cooperation between Vestas and Micon necessitated a management shift, prompting the board to appoint a new CEO in 2005. The second support activity is human resource management. A larger organisation and more employees affect the entire organisation and HR function. The third and fourth support activities, technology development and procurement, benefit from a more prominent firm's increased resources for new technology and the professionalisation of the procurement process. In conclusion, the value chain encompasses mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions often significantly change a company's value chain. To fully realise the benefits, it is crucial to pinpoint and capitalise on synergies, seamlessly integrate operations, and address both cultural and operational hurdles. Achieving this necessitates meticulous planning and a strategic approach across the value chain. Let us now consider a criticism of the model. Michael Porter's value chain analysis is a central model in strategic management. It is used to understand and optimise companies' internal activities to achieve a competitive advantage. However, as with all theories and models, Porter's value chain has advantages and disadvantages. Here are some of the key points of criticism. The model simplifies reality. Porter's value chain might be considered overly simplistic and static for representing the complexities and dynamics of contemporary businesses. Activities are more interconnected and not as distinctly delineated as the model indicates. The model lacks flexibility. The model presupposes that companies operate with linear and sequential value chains, which may not always reflect reality. Numerous companies function within networks and ecosystems, engaging in interactive activities reliant on external partners. The model ignores technological advances. Technological advancements and digitalization have transformed company operations. Porter's model, conceived in the 1980s, doesn't fully account for the digital transformation prevalent in today's businesses. The model focuses on the internal perspective. The model primarily focuses on internal activities, potentially neglecting vital external elements like customer preferences, market trends and competitors' strategies. A more comprehensive approach encompassing these external factors is essential in today's business environment. The model overestimates company boundaries. Defining precise company boundaries can be challenging in a globalised world with intricate supply chains and collaborations. Porter's value chain model presupposes distinct boundaries, which may not always reflect reality. The model's applicability to service companies is limited. Initially tailored for manufacturing firms, Porter's model might be less applicable or need adjustments for service-oriented companies, where value creation is more intangible and heavily reliant on customer interactions. Despite these criticisms, 
Porter's value chain is still a valuable tool for many companies to analyse and improve their internal processes in a merger or acquisition situation. However, it is essential to supplement this model with other tools and perspectives to gain a more comprehensive understanding of the company's strategic position and potential.